house, uh, which is definitely just across the street over here. Mm -hmm. That's where I was born, and this barn is what my wife made into a home. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor? It was on the radio. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your reaction to it at all? Or? Unbelievable. Uh-huh. Now, did you enlist or were you drafted? Well, I graduated in June of... Uh, 1943, I got my diploma in the morning and got my draft notice in the afternoon mail. <laughs> okay. Um, so you went in in July of 43 then? That's right. All right. Um, where did you go for basic training? Well, uh, first we went to Camp Upton and uh, we uh, were there for just a few days. I can always remember we stopped in at the uh, at Camp Upton, it was kind of late in the evening, they had spaghetti for supper, and some Italian guy said, you call this shit spaghetti? <laughs> of course, uh, that didn't go over too good with the uh, kitchen personnel. He spent the next 16 or 18 hours <laughs> scrubbing pots. <laughs> and, then, and then a couple of days later, we were loaded on... Uh, passenger train which seemed to pull off to the side every time a freight train wanted to go through and it was a uh, coal burning train and you can imagine the smoke and soot that came back it was unbelievable of course nobody knew where, where we were headed for but finally uh, we wound up at Fort McClellan Alabama So that's where you uh, spent your time in basic there? So what, uh, then uh, I was assigned to uh, the 19th Battalion, Company C, which was uh, specialized in 81 mortars and the water-cooled 30 caliber machine gun. And that's what I trained as. And of course it was always the... Uh, uh, calisthenics and the various classes you went through for gas mask and all this sort of thing. But I'll never forget when uh, they took us out, they're going to give us a little uh, information about how the artillery operated. So we're kind of sitting on this hillside and the 155 roar overhead land out into the pine forest and the or the lieutenant says, do you think anybody could live through that? And about that time, six or eight deer come roar, roaring out of the woods. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> so that was the end of that. How long were you at Fort McClellan? I believe it was 16 weeks training. Mm -hmm. where, did you, where did you go from there? Well, uh, after... Uh, Fort McClellan, I was uh, given a delay en route. I came home for a few days. Then I went to uh, Fort Meade. I was only there a few days when I got shipped down to uh, uh, Camp Patrick Henry. And that was a kind of a mud hole at the time. It would just had been made. And <clears throat> shortly after that, We loaded on the uh, General Butner, a, a troop ship, which carried thousands of men, and it traveled all alone. And across the sea, we went and wound up at Casablanca.
Now, how long were you uh, in North Africa? Well, we were uh, just uh, a short time. I, I think we landed at Casablanca. I went to uh, Camp Lion Mountain. And a few days later, we were loaded on uh, 40 and 8 boxcars, which everybody knows is 40 men or 8 horses, mm -hmm. and started to cross Africa. And we uh, stopped momentarily at City Bell Abbey's, the uh, home of the French Foreign Legion. Then we went on to Oran, and uh, we loaded on a uh, British ship. It had been uh, taken over by, from the Dutch by the British because uh, Holland had been captured by the Germans. And uh, we loaded on that, and uh, a bunch of uh, Goumiers loaded on. There were uh, French North African troops, mountain troops, and of course they loaded on. They had women with them, plus their goats, which they <laughs> led on board the ship. Oh boy. Um. Did you have any contact with them, the, the North African troops? Were, you know, no. were they in a separate part of the They're ship? They were a separate part of the ship mm -hmm. because they all carried knives. <laughs> <laughs> hey, where did you go uh, after you left North Africa? Well, we went across the Mediterranean and arrived at Napoli, Naples, and uh, the, uh, I remember the uh, Vesuvius was erupting and the twin streams of lava coming down the side of the mountain. Uh, the uh, German Air Force was there to greet us. And at, the, at night the sky was loaded with tracers and, and bursting any air, aircraft shells. Just unbelievable. And... <clears throat> From there we went, uh, well, I just stayed there for a short time, and the next thing I know we're loaded on trucks, and we're heading back for the port of Naples, and we went through a little village of Bagdoli before we got to Naples, and somebody had written on the wall, uh, and when he goes to heaven to see St. Peter, he will tell Another dog face reporting, sir, I've spent my time in hell. <laughs> so we loaded on uh, LSTs in the harbor of Naples. And nobody, of course, knew where that, where we were going. And all the Italian workers around said, oh, you're going to Anzio. They were right. We went to Anzio. We, uh, oh, I forgot to mention that when I was in uh, Naples, we uh, went to uh, St. Angelo de Leaf, which was a uh, where the 34th Division had been pulled back after they got the hell knocked out of them at the casino. And they had to get new uh, replacements and all that sort of thing. Uh, when uh, we got there, it was in the evening. I ganged up with another guy and we put our pup tent up. The next morning we woke up, there was about eight inches of snow. The pup tent was laying right on top of us. And we went to the CP and uh, they asked what I trained as. And I told them 81 mortars and a heavy machine gun. And they said, okay, report to the sergeant in the weapons platoon of Company B, which I did. And I was put in a machine gun squad. So you came in as a replacement then? That's right, yeah. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> well, when the uh, when we landed at uh, Anzio, the uh, Germans had the same party going again in, for bombing the place. And up in the hills there was a gun that we referred to as Anzio Annie. It was, uh, during the day it was pulled back into a tunnel and uh, 
they take it out and fire a couple of rounds into Anzio or into the harbor. And when this shell was going through the air, it sounded like a freight train going sideways. It was terrific noise. If it hit a building, the whole building was totally destroyed. Big building there. <clears throat> and now, did you have winter gear at this time? No. The we had to, what we had wore before, we had overcoats and like that, but not mm -hmm. not really equipped for the winter time yet, un unfortunately. You didn't have uh, rubber boots or gloves? or We had gloves, but no rubber boots, same, same leather mm -hmm. boots we had before. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how were you treated as a replacement? Well, uh, Got along great with everybody. Seemed to, you know, work right in with them. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you were last ammo bearer, you became first gunner for a very short time. Mm -hmm. So. That's uh, what, what was the beach like at Anzio when you were there? When I, well, actually, it was only uh, ten miles square, I believe. The uh, Alban Hills surrounded it. Of course, that's where all the Germans were looking down on us like a bunch of little animals walking or mice walking around in the, below them. And during the day, there was no activity at all because they would, the shells would come in, they, anything could be hit. Evacuation hospitals were right next to ammo dumps and everything. I was so crowded with uh, equipment and all that sort of thing. Uh, at at night, of course, it went it was a, just a big beehive of a, of activity, uh, supplies and the LSTs that pull in and with the uh, trucks on board loaded with ammo and equipment, and they just pull off and race to the uh, place where they had to unload it and then get back on the LST to leave before dawn, so they get get the hell out of there. You said you were afraid while you were there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, one of the first things we saw when we landed was a, a cemetery. It was <laughs> thousands of crosses in it, which didn't build up the morale mm -hmm. at all. Well, actually, I believe if anybody has ever, ever been in combat, if they're not scared, they're lying like hell. It's indescribable. Now, you were wounded at Anzio. Could you tell us about that? Uh, well, on May 23rd, 1944, that was the breakout from Anzio. Of course, uh, I was, me and Harry Lewis were in a machine gun nest. Uh, of course, nobody uh, told us what was going to happen that morning, but just at daybreak, the American artillery opened up and the uh, of course, we're out close out there. They called it Brown Outpost because the sergeant's name was Brown, and this where me machine gun was was called Brown's Outpost. And the Americans opened up with artillery, and it was just—I swear, if they held a match up, you could light it because they were just falling out in front of us, you know, not very far out. And uh, the. Uh, <coughs> Of course, the Germans started to retaliate, and uh, this uh, <coughs> mortar shell, I, I landed, I don't think, over two feet from where our machine gun was. The Harry didn't get hurt at all. I had a chunk of uh, mortar shell about as big, big as my thumb went in one side of my leg and came out the other. and. Uh, I, I imagine it was one of the reasons it didn't bleed very much was because it was so damn hot. It was a piece of shell, but ripped my pants open and uh, well, when it hit me, I thought somebody belted me with a uh, baseball bat. That's what it felt like. And so we sprinkled some sulfur powder onto it and put the put a bandage on it. 
and uh, he helped me get back. There was a army jeep with the medics in it, a short distance away. He helped me get back to that jeep, and afterwards he told me when he get, went back to get the machine gun, it was totally destroyed. And besides that, we had been walking on the wrong side of the white tape <laughs> where the mines had been cleared. But we were lucky we didn't hit nothing. If we had, I wouldn't be here, be around here to tell you this. So then, uh, very shortly, uh, well, they got me back to an evacuation hospital. They didn't do hardly anything there. They just made sure the wound wasn't bleeding any and he got loaded on an LST and back to Naples we went and then an army ambulance took me up to uh, the 17th General Hospital. It was a Italian hospital and of course the United States Army had taken it over and it was called the 17th General and then I went to surgery and they fixed me up. How long were you uh, at the hospital? I don't know, not a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> fortunately, uh, it didn't hit a bone, it just went through the flesh. Then we did have a little fun there at the hospital. The, uh, we talked to one of the, <clears throat> the ward I was in, we talked one of the ward boys into going out and getting a few bottles of cognac. And uh, when he, after he brought it back and everybody helped themselves, they all got plastered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the nurse, of course, was <laughs> beside herself. She got a doctor in there and oh, they raised hell with all of us. The ward boy, I think he got transferred to some other place <laughs> for some reason or other. <laughs> oh. Now, um, what was the food like, uh, both at Anzio and then in the hospital? What? I know it was different, but... Oh, yeah. At Anzio, we had either K's or C's. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have shortages at all? Or no. They kept you no. pretty well equipped? Yeah. In the hospital, the food wasn't that bad. It was pretty mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. um, did you get a leave, or did you go right back to the front lines? I went back, right back to the, rejoin the company, and... Mm -hmm. Uh, they were a little above Rome, and they were, of course, they were chasing the uh, Germans up the peninsula there. Now, um, did were there a lot? Had there been a lot of casualties in your unit by the time you got back? Or? Oh, I, fortunately, I recognized some of them, but there was a lot of new faces there. You were reassigned to a machine gun? Oh, know? I was right back in the same outfit, same outfit, the same. Harry Lewis was there, and okay. all the guys I knew, mm -hmm. Joe Lewis, Luke Lucatordo, and all of them. This Lucatordo was very good, uh, was Italian, he could speak Italian very good, which helped out. However, in uh, southern Italy, he was great. When he got to northern Italy, the dialect was different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, did, did you carry uh, an M1 Garand besides the heavy machine gun? No, I was, as a gunner I carried 45, and sometimes I carried the base plate, or not the base plate, but the tripod, uh -huh. or the gun itself. And uh, never forget this, we're climbing up a steep bank and, and uh, the, the, this other guy had the gun and he fell down and he slid down the bank on his face with all, all the mud in his face and laughed like hell at him and he was mad. <laughs> what are you laughing at, you know? <laughs> it was just hilarious the way it happened. Uh -huh. Unbelievable. And well, you, you never knew when... Uh, you were going to run into the Germans again when they were going to have another little deal to 
set you back. Uh, sometimes it was, uh, they had an 88 lined up. Sometimes it was machine guns or something. But you never knew when you might run into them. So when you're traveling along the road about 15 yards apart, you always, your eyes are darting from one place to another. Where is a low spot that I can get the hell down so I can get out of the line of fire if the machine gun opens up on me or uh, anything like that. We were going down a small creek bed and my ammunition bearer, Gibson, Gibby we call him, was right behind me, short distance and, uh, and uh, in the distance we could hear the thunk when the, they dropped the mortar shell into the tube, you know, you hear a thump, 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 and where are they, you know? And sure enough, one landed behind me. I think it was closer to me than anybody. I didn't get a scratch, but Gibby went down. I raced back and yelled, started yelling for medics, and he said, ask me, he said, am I going to die? And it was just seconds later, and he's starting to turn gray already. And I said, oh, no, Gib, you'll, you'll be seeing those pretty nurses a very short time. But I knew I was lying to them at, at the time. Did you ever have problems with your, your weapon, the machine gun? Do you have to do a lot of repairs on it, or were there any... Problems with the jamming or no, anything? Or no, I never... Uh, always reliable? Always, always seemed to work great. Never had no problem like that. Of course, we always uh, pulled every, out every fifth round, which was a tracer, and replaced it. <laughs> because, so it uh, wouldn't give away our position mm -hmm. as easily. It must have been tough trying to keep it clean, though, after you, you had to use it and then, you know, oh, pick it up and travel once, with it and... Every once in a while we get a new down. barrel. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Did you run into many ambushes? Well, that was uh, the whole thing until we got up to the uh, Gothic line, which was in the Apennines. And uh, <coughs> the colonel told us, men, we're going to Bologna. Of course, he was <coughs> correct, but it was. X number of months later before we got there, we started up the Gothic line and it was uh, getting winter. This is about the time we got our winter clothing. They uh, gave us uh, sleeping bags which we cut holes in so we could have our arms out so we could grab our weapons easier. We were on uh, Highway 65 and the Paso del Fuda, the Fuda Pass, about uh, in the vicinity of Loi, uh, uh, Livernano, which everybody called Livern Onions. Mm -hmm. And uh, just back down the road a short distance was Loiano. And they also gave us, uh, oh, what the heck do you call them? Not a jacket, but a with a hood on it. Parka. Parka, but nobody would. It was green on one side and white on the other, but we nobody would wear the hood because you couldn't hear. And uh, that was the uh, for the whole winter, which oh, a lot of snow, colder than hell. We. Uh, we're in a little stone house, kind of a strong point, with a machine gun plus all the squad members and the mortar squad was squads weren't too far away either. And I remember a guy by the name of Pardue. During the day, we didn't have, didn't you know, have a real too many people on guard just. One or, one or two watching, and Pardue was looking out the window, 
and apparently a sniper had got into some position and shot him right between the eyes. And about this time, we, uh, Harry Lewis and I got <coughs> information from the sergeant. We had to pick up and go back to Loiano that night. And the reason we had to go to Loiano was there was a court martial against a guy by the name of Sharp from Pennsylvania who had been in our machine gun squad. It so it seems so happens that. Uh, I forgot to tell this, when we were on the beachhead and we were getting ready to move out again at one time, I hear this shot and then there was uh, somebody screaming for medics. Sharp said he was cleaning his 45 and he shot himself through the foot. Sometimes I wonder if I heard somebody yell medics first and then the shot or vice versa. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he had given himself up after several months, and uh, he was in for court-martial. Uh, uh, <coughs> his defense attorney, lieutenant, called Harry in, and he asked him a question. He said, would you like to have Private Sharp back with you? And, yes, sir. And he called me and, would you like to have Private Sharp back with you in the company? Yes, sir. So, out. We wait a while. Out comes Sharp. How'd you do, Sharp? They gave me 75 years. <laughs> so, uh, if you need somebody for uh, to help you out, don't ask me. <laughs> now, how badly was his foot wounded then? Oh, I don't know how he... Why, how he didn't uh, screw up all the bones? Yeah, how he didn't yeah. screw up all the bones and, and and be totally disabled? You know, somehow or other, I don't know, missed. <laughs> uh, he was just actually in that way. He was very fortunate. Yeah. But, so whatever happened to him, did he have to I don't know. He was just gone. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Now you you said you were close friends with this Harry Lewis, but you called him the old man of the. the no, outfit? no, that's, that was Pappy Girk. Oh, okay. I, I know you wrote that down, and mm -hmm. okay. he was well, like we're all about nineteen or twenty years old, uh -huh. and he's about twenty six or twenty seven. Of course, he's an old person at that uh -huh. that age, you know. He was a, a very good. Hell of a good soldier. He was, uh, matter of fact, I kept in contact with him for years, and, and he passed away a few years ago. So, <clears throat> and Harry Lewis, I still keep in contact with him. He's out in Illinois, and I still give him a call, a phone call every once in a while. So, now you were wounded a second time. Where where was that? No. Uh, <coughs> we were uh, attacking a little town by the name of Fogula, and uh, as we were kind of, they were up kind of looking the place over, we had, a, we were just sitting there, we had a little break, and uh, I decided now is the time to eat my beans, and just about this time, I believe it was uh, some German air and aircraft outfit. We had probably pushed out ahead of the rest of them, and they spotted us, and they opened up on us with a 20 millimeter. Well, this uh, this olive orchard was all terraced with stone, and when the stuff started flying through the air, I, I dived over a bank and got right up close to uh, the stone wall as tight as I could, but uh, I thought I felt something and I reached around my on my cheek and my ass and sure enough there's blood. And a short time later I got uh, sent back to the medics and uh, went to the hospital. They took the shrapnel out of my rump and 
I also had some of my left ankle. They took that out. <coughs> then about a short time after that, I contracted uh, hepatitis, yellow jaundice, and I'm back in the 17th General Hospital again with yellow jaundice. There was a heck of a big ward there. Everybody had yellow jaundice. It looked like a Chinese army to me. And then at night, why we would see the various uh, gurneys go out with the people that had died during the course of time. That was it still in Naples? That was in Naples, yeah. Now, do you know how you contracted it, or? Well, they always say dirt, filth. What did we never uh -huh. got around to getting bathing that much, or uh -huh. you always wore the same clothes. You didn't dare take anything off. You had to be dressed every minute. There was no, you know, you didn't hardly want to take your shoes off because you didn't know when you were going to have to get going. Mm -hmm. How long were you in the hospital this time? Oh, gee, I don't know. Several weeks. But I do remember they, the, they uh, served a steak, which was drier in a bone because all the fat had to be off of it. But they loaded us up with, they'd have a steak sandwich at night even to uh, get to get our liver working properly again, I guess that was the idea. And for many people it did work great. Now did you return to your unit after, after that? Oh yes, uh, back to the same outfit, Company B, the machine gun squad, and back with my buddy Harry Lewis. He, he was one of the lucky ones, he never got hit. And uh, when we went back, we landed at uh, Liverano, which is, they call, uh, Americans call Leghorn. We went back by ship. And uh, from there, we went by truck to the, uh, where the 168 was uh, <coughs> the, the uh, portion that, like, the, the backup people were, the, uh, CP and all that stuff for the for the whole re the regimental CP mm -hmm. and uh, then of course at night when it was dark why well, the unit was back, still up on the line so to get up there we had to go up with a mule train well the uh, mule train is it, pitch black there's no light whatsoever it's growing through the mountains on a little narrow trail, so the best thing to do was grab a mule by the tail and hang on, because the mule apparently could see better than you could, and wasn't going to step off the edge of the cliff. So that's how we got back to the unit. And at the same time I went back, there would be replacements going back, too. And... Uh, Sometimes these replacements were killed or wounded before the next day even. I, 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 some of them never got there. It was unbelievable, you know. I mean, you never even got to see their face. It was black night. Then, of course, after they dumped off the ammunition and the, uh, <coughs> the other supplies for the guys that were on the front there, why then... The, uh, they loaded up the, the dead bodies in the mattress covers, put them on the mules. The mules didn't like this at all because they knew what it was, and they were <laughs> rather cantankerous, shall we say, about uh, carrying back the, the dead. did you go next? Well, on the Gothic line, we, uh, they finally spring came. We was glad to see spring come because it got milder. Of course, the mud was terrible. But we knew that if, when spring came, we're going to attack again. And uh, 
it wasn't long before the word came, I forget just when it was, April or something like that, <coughs> they decided they're going to punch down into the Po Valley. Well, the, uh, first, uh, the uh, 168 was going to be one of the point units to uh, jump off into the Po Valley, and I can never forget that when we're uh, going along, we uh, look back and, and, and spot a little sign that the Germans had put there which said, Achtun Meinen, and we had walked through that place. Fortunately, none of us got uh, stepped on one at the time. I do remember our uh, radio operator, Anderson, he had stepped on one and it blew his foot right off and he uh, died from shock. We, when we finally got into the Po Valley, <coughs> it was, uh, we, uh, we found a lot of bunkers that the Germans had been in and uh, we had this lieutenant who had, was a 90 day wonder who had just joined the outfit and uh, he was referred to as Lieutenant Meathead because uh, he insisted on wearing his gold bars, which no other officer ever did, because they knew they'd be the first one to be shot if, if somebody spotted it. But anyway, uh, a bunch of Germans wanted to surrender and they raced right up to him and surrendered to him and one of the guy, one of the Germans could speak English and they said they surrendered to him because they saw he was an officer. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, jeez. Did you ever get any leave time while you were... Oh yeah, I uh, went to Alasio, Italy. It's on the Tyrian Sea, way up on the uh, on the northwest corner of Italy, and it was a beautiful uh, sandy beach, and uh, they even had this issued beer up there for heaven's sakes. And uh, so there for a few days, when you went into town, there was a big sign that said "Enlisted Men Only, Officers Only Allowed If Accompanied by an Enlisted Man." <laughs> 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 then I got to Rome for a while, and uh, I saw all the uh, various, the Vatican and uh, the Colosseum and all the various sites there, and I even, the uh, arena where they were going to have the 1940 Olympics, uh, it was quite a, all the statues and everything around, it was unbelievable. Uh, got around and chased the girls every once in a while. It was very <coughs> exciting. Did you uh, get to see any USO shows at all? Oh, I got, uh, uh, let's see, it was, uh, well, Andrew Sisters. Mm -hmm. Somehow or another we got, uh, <coughs> a chance to see them and we got trucked over there and we're sitting on like a it's like an amphitheater on a hillside and they had a stage set up and it's raining it started raining and the girls the, their mascara is running right down their face and they stayed right there and sung and that one soldier got up and left all of them. he got soaked you know <laughs> they stayed right there it was un unbelievable so you didn't see Bob Hope or anything? No, I didn't see no. him, no. Well, you, you must have been in combat almost all the way to the end. Oh, yeah. The it was, uh, when we, after we broke into the Po Valley, why, the unit was racing back and forth so much it was unbelievable because the Germans were trying to get to the Austrian border 
and we would go out at one point and block them off and then oops you got to race back to another place and I got to I was in all the uh, oh I, I, I got to Milano I saw where uh, Mussolini and Clara his uh, mistress were strung up by their heels in the gas station there in Milano and if name any city in the and they're up there, and I, I was there actually. Busto Arizio, Torino, Trieste, Parma, Verona, Pistoia, any of them say I was there. I was up on the Austrian border, and I was over on the French border, and uh, the Italians and the French were having an argument over who owned some rocky old mountain over there, so they sent our outfit over there to kind of stand in between them, <laughs> keep them get going into battle. We had a big, uh, the uh, battalion had a big, uh, like a big uh, march through this village there to kind of cool them down a little bit. That we were there to keep order. And then uh, after that deal they sent us over near Trieste. There had been a naval uh, arsenal over there, Italian naval arsenal over there. Well all the uh, powder increments were in cloth bags and the local population of course, there's no more Italian army there. They got into there and they're dumping out these powder increments to get these cloth bags. Well, unfortunately, somebody decided that now's the time to light up a cigarette. And the, the one building was, there was nothing, it was just blew, blown right flat. So we went over there to stand guard on the rest of them that were still standing keep the people out of there. But did they want the cloth? They wanted the cloth bag, that's all. Huh. Mm -hmm. uh, how were your, what your, were your relationships like with the Italian people? Did you have much contact? Not an awful lot. Uh, uh, the uh, one time earlier, I got to tell you about uh, this Harry Lewis and I, when we were moving up north of Rome, we got to this one place and there was uh, several Italian partisans came up and they wanted to just come to their little village and we said how far are the Tedesco you know Dove Tedesco where are the Germans and uh, they, they said they're five kilometers away well how far is the village they said three kilometers they said okay we'll go <laughs> like idiots we went we went and of course as we pulled in, they uh, found a couple of bikes for us to ride. So we ride into the village and we're pelted with flowers and of course we're drinking vino and getting all smoked up and we hung around there for a while and then we got back to the company. But after we thought about it, what idiots we were <laughs> to go that far out. That was exciting at all. Unbelievable. You wrote down a story about uh, a friend named Comer. Oh, his carbine. Uh, one went, yes, that happened when we were uh, uh, chasing the Jerry uh, north of Rome. Uh, we moved into this little village. It was all stone places, and as uh, a matter of fact, when we got in there, there was still embers in the fireplace. So. It was getting toward dusk, so we decided, well, we better uh, put a shelter half off over the door so no light shows through, and got the fire going a little bit. And matter of fact, we went upstairs and was digging around in some wheat and found some hams in there. And uh, Harry and I was up there going to rest a little while. Combers downstairs. The door opens and somebody pushes the shelter half back and the comber yells, 
Jerry and grabs his carbine. The friggin' clip falls out of it. <laughs> the, the Germans took off running down the street. And you could hear them hobnails clicking on the stone uh, roadway, you know, and nobody got a shot at it. <laughs> However, the next morning when I started looking around with binoculars, I, our old Sergeant Griska there, who was the head of the mortar platoon there, he had his mortar set up and were out in front of us. They spotted some Jerry's out there and they started dropping mortar shells onto them. It was un un just unbelievable. So the guy that ever throw a grenade in there, he would have got us all. Mm. Those funny, strange things happen like that. And sometimes some of them you live to talk about. Mm -hmm. So where were you when the war ended? Oh, I was up in the uh, Pole Valley up near Trieste at the time. And... Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, they, uh, we were over there because the uh, Yugoslavians and the Italians were having a big debate over who was going to own Trieste. I mean, I think it was Italian owned at the time, but there was always a big debate over who, who should own the city of Trieste. So we're, we were over there, in the same uh, deal, trying to keep the peace. And while I was over there, uh, I had a chance to go to Switzerland. And I took that up, and it was uh, unbelievable, the uh, transportation in Switzerland, the train. If they said the train is moving out at 9.05, you better be on it, because at 9.05 it moved out, and it was just as clean, and People were nicely dressed and, and unbelievable, and, and an awful lot of them could speak English, and they could uh, <coughs> converse with you, and they say, "How do you like our country?" and and they had damn good beer, light or dark, which one do you want? And the cheese is very delicious. Uh, I can remember staying at the Golf Hotel in Montre, and. I remember going to the beer pits in Bern, Switzerland, and they also had a village clock. This clock, you wouldn't imagine what happened. When it was going to strike the hour, a little door would open, and this uh, like, looked like a little man came out with a hammer, and he would uh, hit the number of uh, times for the hour. And a, another little door would open and there would be three bears spinning around on it. Another door would open and out would come a big uh, rooster and crow. And uh, you'd, uh, the, it had to have a guide to point out, now watch here, watch there, because there's so many things that happened. Somebody told me at one time they did have that on uh, television, that, that clock. I don't know, you ever see it? No, I don't think uh, was, It's just unbelievable. What, uh, what this clock would do when the uh, when it struck the hour. <clears throat> then uh, I got back from uh, Switzerland, and uh, they told me you better saddle up because it's time to go home. And we went back to Napoli, and there's the USS Wasp waiting. And they loaded thousands of troops on board. <clears throat> and, of course, the bunks were if you pushed your knee up, you bumped the guy in the rump up above you. It was about six or eight high, I guess. And uh, away we went. And that was uh, about, it had been about two years since I'd had a hot dog. And I, I remember we had hot dogs in that damn USS Wasp. <laughs> Tasted so great, you know, after all that time. When were you discharged? Oh, December 45. Mm -hmm. uh, did you uh, 
Did you use the GI Bill at all? No, I didn't. No. Um, Fifty-two twenty club. Oh yeah, I was in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I uh, let's see. I, in April, I got a job with the state, and then I continued on uh, working with the state. Worked my way up to I finally became chief up to lock thirteen on the Barge Canal. And that's... Do you join any veterans organizations ever? Oh, I'm Purple Heart and the DAV. Mm -hmm. And of course I'm in the uh, 34th Infantry Division. Do you ever uh, go to any reunions? No, I haven't. Mm -hmm. I, but you have stayed in contact with some... Oh yes, yes, definitely. Well, I became life member. Mm -hmm. But uh, my wife suffering strokes have kind of made it impossible mm -hmm. to go. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Well, I think it had a good effect. I look at the people I think I risk my life for and some of them I look at and I say, what in hell did I risk my life for for that person? Uh, and that, but then I, then I think back, that, well, there was, there's hundreds of other ones that mm -hmm. appreciated what I did, but mm -hmm. some of them, uh, unbelievable, I can't mm -hmm. stomach them, actually. Could you hold the photographs in front of you and tell us when, where and when was that taken? This was taken in Italy in 1944. Okay. This was taken a Memorial Day parade here in Tribes Hill, 2005. The Marine is Brett Hayes. Then the soldier is Frank Roberts. They were both had been in Iraq. And of course, myself, who was the great, happened to be the Grand Marshal of the parade, and uh, I asked these guys, I said, well, i got to wait another 60 years before I'm Grand Marshal again. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. <laughs> well, I hope I hit everything. You did.